A lot of you will have known over the years that I've been talking about um, how, we, in, uh, how research and product kind of meld and join together. And although I haven't stood up in this forum and talked about it for uh, quite a little time, I have been thinking about it. <coughs> And the issue really stems from what the role of research is in ARM, then we can understand what the relationship is with external research as well. And it also helps us to understand how research flows into, into the product domain, which should certainly be interesting to you, um, because uh, again, the activity here is, is not to do these things in isolation. So I, I, I started thinking then in a, in a more general sense, and this is going to be a little bit of a, of a ramble through this, because I, I think it's important to get some context in this. So we know that research does get into product, but if you look at those two products, which are in my um, time space, when I first came into this business, that was a telephone at the bottom, and I, I was relating a story that I, I once went home one, one night and explained to my wife that I was designing telephones, and she paused and came back to me and said, but we've already got a telephone. And this idea then of, of things evolving was so much part of my mind, yet was not part of her mind as a consumer. And of course, they've been evolving, evolving hugely. So this, um, this bottom one has no transistors in it at all. Um, it's an electrical circuit. The other one, of course, has billions of transistors in it. Not only transistors, but it also has software. And you've got to ask, you know, I moved from that bottom domain, the, the phones that I were designing were the, were the next levels up on that first one, and of course the, the phones that I'm still involved in are up in that area. We've, we've acquired IC design engineers, we've also acquired embedded software engineers and systems engineers in the product which is still the same. So this is something which has come along along the way, uh, even though the product is still fundamentally the same product. Because these things have changed so much, I asked the question, um, is it possible to learn from our history, because, or have the products become so different that the, what we're effectively doing is screwing up everything and starting all over again? And so I went back to, to some of our earlier ancestors, because I think this also turns out to be an interesting lesson, because uh, we are, as a race, only 35,000 years old. Cro-Magnon man, that's us. Um, really, uh, a lot of his time was spent surviving nature. A thousand generations, pretty well. After 32,000 years, he'd got to that mud hut for his technology achievement. <coughs> it was quite an achievement, of course, because he was then, at le then able to be at least warm and to think around a little bit. And it was the philosophers who appeared two and a half thousand years ago, and they started trying to make some sort of sense of the environment that was all around them. They were focusing on understanding nature, and they weren't actually thinking about what happens when you do complex things with it, but just what is this fire stuff, what is this water stuff, what about the air that we breathe? And it wasn't until the scientists made an appearance, only around a thousand years ago, that they started knocking things together, putting water and um, uh, earth together and, look, and looking at mud and trying to make uh, things which represented, you know, uh, when, you, when you do things with something, you end up with something else. So like trying to boil the gold out of urine, for example. Uh, this is manipulation of nature, trying to think that you've, we've learned some properties, now we can actually do something with those properties of materials, which might turn out to be interesting. But it wasn't until 1750, the Industrial Revolution, that we made the first, which was exploitation. Because this was the industrialization of, uh, of science and technology, if you like. And it was the point at which somebody had realized that not only could you do something which was interesting by manipulating these characteristics, but actually you could do something which has a commercial value. It was a breakthrough, and if you look at the uh, evolutions of t uh, evolution of technology, it really did start there. Before that time, there was no cash flowing back into the life cycle. It therefore didn't have sustainability. So I think of this as our big bang. 250 years ago, that's all. That's not many lifetimes. The interesting thing is you can put that line onto it. There was a research phase, there was a development phase, and there was a product phase, and it was what was it, uh, two and a half thousand years long. So we've done quite a bit to shorten that time scale, but we're still doing the same thing. We're still investigating uh, basic properties. We're still looking at what happens when you co combine those properties. And we're looking at how you can uh, make something which represents a product out of that. So we've done some pretty startling things 
but we've done something which is actually very predictable. It's been in, in our lifetime, in our, um, in our psyche since the very beginning. So I'm going to look at the uh, computation and I'm not going to dwell on this except to say that it is a process of modelling and uh, if we look at computation as uh, an exercise of predicting something which is useful to humans then you also find that computation has been around for quite a long time too. Uh, this is the Antikythera uh, 100 BC, that's going back some. Um, it was a mechanical computer for, for computing the position of planets because it mattered to somebody. Now they, they reckon there might have been tens of these things, but they really were a prototype and they were put together in an era when you didn't go down to B&Q and buy a piece of metal and buy some files and set about filing the wheels. You pretty well had to make the metal yourself and if you couldn't join it together, well you had to invent a process like riveting to join it together. And if you wanted a file, then you had to make the file. You had to, so all of the processes of creating this are very different, but the objective was to model something which was important to humans. Now, if you go up forward 1,800 years after Antikythera, you get this, which is, if you like, the, pro the product productized version of the Antikythera. This is uh, uh, Graham's, what's his name, George Graham's uh, orrery, but it's essentially the same thing. It's a little bit more exotic looking, but nevertheless, it took 1,800 years to get from a prototype product through to something which was now going to be available in, in much greater numbers uh, for a market which was prepared to pay for it. But still the need was there to actually understand the relative positions in, and so on. <coughs> now everybody's familiar with uh, Babbage's difference engine. And the reason we're looking here, and we're starting to see the differences of technology. We've got a technical problem, a computation which needs to be done. And we've got some technologies, and we're going to apply those technologies in a way, because we're engineers and scientists, in a way which is going to deliver a product. Now this is an interesting product because again it was aimed at, at producing something which was required, which was polynomial tables by now, 1837. But the problem was this particular product went beyond the capabilities of the, of the technology of that time. So although it was designed, although it was capable of doing what it set out to do, what it was ultimately demonstrated that it could do, it wasn't until 2000 that the technology had got to a point at which they could actually make it. Um, now, of course, the, uh, the uh, classic problem had arisen by then is that this had become an irrelevant approach for solving the same problem. So although it was possible to make this by, the, by now, other technologies had come in which enabled the polynomial tables to be calculated in different ways and in point of fact had removed the need for the polynomial tables at all, simply putting it into the, uh, into the complex comp uh, calculating power of a, of a modern computer. So you go, but you also have things like this, and this is a marvellous device, I don't know how many of you have ever played with a planimeter, but this is a, it's a, a friction-led um, machine which remarkably accurately solves that equation at the bottom. For an arbitrary two-dimensional shape, it works out the area of the shape. And it's still, this, this particular one is 1850, but you can still buy them in 2014. These are digitized versions of the same thing. But the, a thing, the technology which enabled the original one from Amsler was improved metals, improved availability of metals, but also the improved uh, machining. So the thing which is not visible on that, in that product is the machinery which enabled you to make it. So it's interesting, that technology was included in the product, but is not a part of the product. So the parts list for the planimeter does not include the lathe. And then of course we've got Baby, and I couldn't go to Manchester without mentioning Baby, could I? Um, and of course this is another computing machine. It's become a little bit um, novel because here we see a stored program characteristic, so it doesn't have to be any particular machine. But it's interesting to note that even if you've got something like a weather machine, a weather predicting computer, you're actually using it for the vast majority of the time for exercising one set of algorithms. But I've made the point already, I'll say it again. It, these, are, this, these products which have come along to meet a human need have all been limited by technology. So the technology, the engineer, the ingenuity of the engineers and people who put them together were essentially, how can I solve this problem using the technology which is available to me? Because you can't use technology which is not available to you. Now, it may be obvious. 
But available technology then limits product options and the technology and tools available when you start your product development limit the technology you can utilize in your product. So again, we've got this idea now that the, the process of creating a product is something that starts before there is a product and it continues until the product is available. And you, you, you can't start that product using a technology that isn't available to you. You can't have magic happens here in the process for doing it. You have to know, because you're in business and businesses are not there for charitable reasons, you have to have a fairly high degree of certainty that you can get down the process of, produ of delivering a product because that's what you, what you want to do. Um, the implication of it though is that there is this, this line, theory becomes science, becomes technology, becomes product. And it's kind of presented as a linear model and you still hear alarmingly people talking about this today. Um, the truth is, it's not like that. You know, the mechanical uh, technologies which are available in those products that, we went that I demonstrated before were one of the technologies that went into them. It's like the lathe was a technology that went into the uh, planimeter which doesn't show on the outside. It's not one theory that leads to one product in the majority of cases. It might be if you're in the uh, aspirin business and you need to you know, have this, this concept of a, uh, a pain-killing drug and you have the exercise of making a product out of it is essentially a linear, a linear process. But in the vast majority of cases, it's a more complex story than that. What we do see, though, is a, conclu is a conclusion that new, techno new technology only offers product options. So the introduction of a new technology doesn't fundamentally change the product. What it actually does is it enables you to think of different ways of delivering a product. And the vast majority of products already exist. So that we're not, uh, if you're talking about a, um, a diary, for example, a diary existed in a paper form for many years. Uh, it existed, I guess, before that as, uh, as chalk on, on stone walls. I must, I'm keeping a record of the days as they go past and so on. As we introduced electronic technology, embedded software and so on, we were able to reconfigure the diary to make it, uh, to make it different in its implementation technology, but it's still a diary. And so the options that, are, that have been included in it to make that diary uh, better, more serviceable, higher performance and so on, have been things which were commercializable advantages. But there were other things, other sciences and technologies, which didn't make it into the, uh, the diary. For example, there's, there's probably not much in, in terms of um, uh, vacuum welding or laser welding technology which goes into most diaries. Um, it's not that the technology isn't important, it isn't valuable, it's just not applicable to that particular domain. <coughs> now I, I guess you've all come across Moore's Law. Uh, I like this particular one though because it, it's one graph that I use in all sorts of ways and this time I'm going to use it in a different way again. Um, First thing, of course, is it's 1999, which is really old, and part of the reason that I use it, though, is that it's got two curves on it, and some of the times I'm, I'm using both curves. So we modify it and bring it up to date a little bit. But it's an interesting point to note that when ARM was formed, and certainly in my mind, this is not very long ago, it's 22, 23 years now, um, but with the chips that we were talking about in those days were around a million transistors. The chips that we're designing today are around 20 billion transistors, 20 billion transistors. That's 20,000 times more transistor capacity and probably another 10 times speed as well. So that's 200,000 times more complex systems being designed, chips being designed today than they were being designed when ARM was founded. So that's not in deep history. This is this one company and the product and the concept then the, the product that we're providing in those days was to help people make complex systems, brackets complex equals a million, versus the products to help people design complex systems where, where today's systems are 200,000 times bigger on one chip, but there are frequently 20 chips inside the system as well, just for good measure. So the, the, pr the concept of ARM's product, although it's notionally the same, the detail of it is very, very different because the problem is, is, is very, very different. So we're looking at electronic systems today and we're kind of used to these. Uh, a few years ago, most of these weren't electronic at all. 
but domestically we've got uh, electronic systems and professionally we've got electronic systems and increasingly these are perch purchased that for their functionality so one of the things that's changed here is that in days gone by the heady days of uh, let's say embryo technology people bought things for the technology it was exciting in itself but now people are buying things for the functionality you don't buy a phone because it's using a certain uh, uh, geometry of CMOS inside it you buy a phone because you want, actually want to phone somebody or you want to use its uh, intelligence capability for texting and, uh, and keeping up with your uh, social networks and so we're also seeing a um, an interesting move here because I think the if we start off with this bottom curve the main curve we tend to think that back in 1970s this is what electronic technology was it was the mainframe computers that was the exciting front end of this thing now other eras come in the mini computer the personal computer the desktop mobile internet and of course internet of things is on is on the horizon we tend to be blinded by the top of this curve but, no, but forget to notice that the bottom ones still exist so these we're still making mainframes and they still are higher numbers than they were in the 70s not hundreds of times bigger but still significantly bigger the machines themselves are much more capable but they're still what in the class of mainframe and these these people here are probably still interested in the technology that goes into it and so we also have this, this line that goes up the, at an angle which basically says the further up that curve you go, the further you're getting away from the technology because those people are the, who are buying the Internet of Things products, well let's even step one down from that, the mobile internet type products, they're not even aware of the fact that there is technology in there, they just know that it's connected. What's going to happen with Internet of Things incidentally is that people are not even going to be aware of the fact that they're buying these things. So they're not even aware that there's, there's a thing inside there, never mind what technology it might use. <coughs> there's a point at the bottom. Oh yes. Interesting to note though, the older markets remain but they inherit the current technology from the lead markets. So the Internet of Things technologies will ripple down to the mainframe technology, to the mainframe computers. So the, the CMOS technology, the smaller geometries will be usable in the mainframe, not only in the Internet of Things. But you will also find that the, the MEMS uh, will make it down into that domain as well. The LCD technology, the RF technology, the communications methods, the uh, optoelectronics, those are things which are, which are going to be driven by the volume markets at the top but they will have a, draw, a, dripple, a drip down or a ripple down effect onto the, uh, onto the lower volume but professionally interesting markets. Now I can't leave this without talking a little bit about business um, because we said in that big bang that um, we needed to have the business element there because it's otherwise it's not sustainable you know we can theorize we can produce our sciences we can produce our technologies but unless we have some sort of link to the business then nobody makes money out of it and nobody effectively says thank you thank you for doing the work on this technology because it's now an important part of our of our product family so if, if it isn't part of the product family then it doesn't get recognition so businesses then are boring they, pr they pr profitably sell what customers, and that's you, want to buy. They focus on their core competencies in a globally competitive market. So this is, this is interesting. It, they fo focus more and more on their core competencies, and they're being driven to that by the global competitive market. So they, there's no point in them trying to do something which other people can do as well or cheaper. You, do it, you, you don't get any particular return on investment for doing that. You focus on the thing which you're, you are expert at doing. And you also have to recognize that you're, you're in competition with a global uh, uh, competition base as well. Your, your competitor is out there in the world, as is your customer. So it works both ways. <coughs> um, they avoid commoditization, so despite the fact that uh, governments will, will tell you that commoditization is a good thing, industry in general thinks it's a bad thing, because we would much rather have an entire market to ourselves and we'd much rather have a nice large market, uh, margin on it, please. And the way that business tends to do that, of course, is by differentiating its product, which is a loop back into that technology. So if I can introduce 
by using technology which is available to me, a differentiation over my competitor's product, then it's something which has got value. And it may only be if I can get hold of blue plastic, and blue plastic is what people want to, uh, to have their phones made out of, then that's a differentiating factor. Not very exciting, perhaps, but nevertheless it's true. Another one, though, could be if you have a, a high-performance uh, robotic assembly line. Again, it could enable you to reduce the uh, cost of your product or maybe even uh, reduce the, uh, or increase the quality of your product. But, but having that differentiation in a product which otherwise looks the same would again enable you to differentiate yourself or increase your margin from your competitors. But it does mean that product development is a cost to be minimized. And, uh, and that's a, uh, an important thing to, to bear in mind. Businesses are not in the business of doing things just because it seems like fun. They do things because it gives them something. And so we have to think then in, in terms of when research is going to contribute something to a business process, then the thing it's got to contribute is something which is going to add value that, has, that can be commercialized. <coughs> So, uh, going back to some history lessons, this is a fun one because this is only 17 years ago and uh, I've presented this to audiences where, uh, where, where the, uh, they're all students and even students then fall inside this, this category, so it's worth thinking about. Because 1998 Canon EOS Rebel GT2 was the sort of camera that um, somebody who's got moderate um, semi-professional interests in taking photography would have looked at. This is something which was fairly expensive and its technologies were, well, lenses, fine mechanical mechanisms, electromechanical exposure meter, barely electronic, uh, metal and some plastic forming. Look at the plastics on that. They're not really terribly sophisticated. Manual assembly, lots of girls sitting in clean, semi-clean room conditions assembling these things. And a photochemical memory. Just happens to be called film, but it's a way of converting a, a three-dimensional image onto a two-dimensional space and mapping it in a way which happens to be compatible with your eye being able to read it. Today's camera, of course, is very different. Um, the same class of camera looks quite a different vehicle, doesn't it? But it really it's doing the same thing. It's still enhancing human memory. Uh, it's got digital technology, whatever that means, digital logic, software, memory. Of course, I'm a camera maker from only 17 years ago. I don't know anything about this. Still has excellent lenses and displays. Yeah, get on with that. But actually, we can do, produce some pretty sophisticated lenses these days. Um, the uh, analog electronics, sensors and transducers, you can see it all the way down. Precision mechanics, micromotors, but also the automated assembly lines, which are able to handle and, co um, and create this product, assemble this product, are doing things it's not possible to do by hand because they are two small pieces being handled to, under, under precise and clean environments. Um, the electronics or robotic assembly. I think the, the thing about it though is all of these technologies are available to all 21st century businesses. So, hey, that's neat. Um, I could go out then and I could buy all of these and I could implement it, couldn't I? I mean, especially they have included ARM technology, which they could buy, and they've included it somehow in their camera. So why couldn't we do the same? So why couldn't ARM make a, cam a camera to compete with Canon? Well, theoretically, we could. We could go out and buy all those things, but there's a lot of other things that we don't, that we don't know as well. I mean, we don't have any kind of commercial experience in selling cameras. We don't know how to get into the high street shops. We don't know how to, set, uh, to approach millions of people all around the world. We only know how to handle an interface to tens of people around the world. There's a lot of things then which I think are identifiable beyond the technologies which make this into a product. <clears throat> So I came to this idea of the capabil capability model then. <coughs> I was troubled because this linear idea of science running through into product really bothered me. And yet we, we can see from the, the examples I, I, I cited there, there are certainly technology in product, but we have to think about how it gets there. So it starts off with this original, this original idea then. You have an idea for a product, it's going to take some work to get there. You need to know what you uh, need, are going to do in the course of developing this product. 
Um, and you, you need to understand before you start working in that area that you can actually get to the end of it. It would be a foolish business that didn't have that in mind. Now if we take any one of these capabilities, and these, te- these capabilities are not restricted to technology, they could be business, they could be uh, finance models, availability of money, they could be distribution channels, information. But I'm going to think of it in terms of technology because that's more uh, closer to our home. We know that we need technology somehow to get into there. So I, pr- I propose that it comes in like this. Technology exists over there to the side. And technology is scaled up science. And so therefore we need science in there. And science is something even more over to the side. But essentially sciences go into technology. And technologies go into capabilities. And it takes work for each one of those steps in between. So a science is a a demonstrated fundamental. Uh, It's predictable, encapsulatable and new. But it's probably not robust or scalable up to anything like the level that is going to be needed to be used in a product. A technology has now gone through a process of scaling. So it's, uh, it's scaled, it's capable, it's demonstrated, it's, it's available, but it's not in the company yet. It's outside, it's on the shelf. It's like having synthesis. You've got a synthesis engine, but you haven't trained your engineers to use it. You've got the synthesis engine, but you don't have the right workstations yet, so you have to buy new workstations and put them in it. You have to find out how to manage it. There's a lot of issues associated with moving between technology and capability. <coughs> But it essentially says, from a business point of view, that that vertical right-hand side development um, is exploit capabilities. And it also says that the role of research then, from a business point of view, is to install the capabilities that we will need when we come to develop the next and subsequent generations of product. So we can look ahead and we can see we will need to have certain capabilities to produce this product today and we will need different capabilities, more or additional ones or revised ones for the products which are going to follow. You know, the 200,000 times bigger products which are going to be uh, in ARM's product portfolio in the next 25 years. They will only be supported as these capabilities move in. But it means you have two roles inside the business. Exploit the capabilities that you have because that's where the money is going to be made. And the other one is get the capabilities that you need in place, in time, for you to do your product development. Because that's your continuity. That's your future. If you don't have those things there, you don't have them. The right-hand end of that, which I think, yep, is on an arrow, is that, that final bit of putting research into a business has to be done by the business. But all the rest of that, le- that left-hand line, the research line, can be done by any sources at all. So there is gap out there for universities, there are gaps out there for research institutes, there are gaps out there for partnering research activities involving companies like ARM and other companies perhaps, or involving semi-funded activities. Essentially it's a portfolio. When you've got all of the research capabilities, you have a map of the capabilities that you need, which includes time, but you also have to then have a portfolio of approaches which are going to deliver the ones that you want. And of course, research isn't guaranteed, so you also have to include in your portfolio the the what-ifs. If it doesn't work, if it doesn't happen, how do we get around it? Now, you will find people talking about technology readiness levels, and... uh, the kind of thing that goes along with technology levels, technology readiness levels, is that by the time it gets to technology re- level 9, it's a product. That's what it says. What it actually says on the, uh, uh, the DARPA description is that it is product ready. Now somebody has made the assumption that product ready equals product. But of course it doesn't. All it means is it's ready to be used to make a product. So it's not a product but it's something which is ready to be used to make a product. So not surprisingly then, we hit technology re- readiness level 9 by the time we get to uh, technologies, sorry, technology level 5 to 9. These things have already got to the top end of the DARPA's uh, technology readiness levels. Business doesn't want uh, capabilities in there which are not capable of delivering the product that it wants, because it's, uh, I mean, businesses don't afford the charity. If they miss their product opportunity because there's a failure in a capability, 
the market doesn't say oh never mind have another go the market says we'll buy it from somebody else and you've lost just like that and because you're in global competition then you might very well find yourself out of business and gone a memory not going to read these things in in full detail but there's a couple of points here research is not only about new exciting stuff it's a lot of it from an industrial point of view is in the known set so it's how other people know um, it's the, the stuff that they know that we want to find out so how somebody else does research we know people sorry how does somebody else does synthesis we know that they're doing synthesis we haven't got the capability ourselves we want to find out how they do it this is not fundamental research it's finding out how how others do it the longer term stuff tends to come from the unknown set uh, so these are the things which are brand new um, but in, in these things because we've already said that sciences and technologies are seldom used in isolation they usually go to improve a technology which is already there what's interesting from our point of view is that these should be guided by a roadmap and this is uh, from our own longer term obje business objectives so we should have a view of where we need to go and these are fairly general views you know we will need to handle 10 nanometers what are we going to do when uh, when we have to handle the reliability or the power issues how are we going to handle the signaling and communications issues I mean these are issues not related to specific product but related to the business direction and those are the topics which we should be using for our own research portfolio and we should be feeding in, in turn through to yourselves to help you to guide the research that we're interested in seeing <coughs> development is exploitative it's about delivery and that's an important one because failure and delivery is not developed product if you don't deliver it's not a product um, engineers however it sounds a little bit like they don't have anything exciting to do anymore but they do because their, their innovative role is not to create the capabilities but to use the capabilities in the most effective way to produce a product which is differentiated so you can you can produce a, a solution a product which is different from somebody else's you see it all around you perfectly good phone A perfectly good phone B phone A is the one that sells happens to be called Apple perhaps but it's, uh, it's, not to do, it's not just to do with the technology to make it work it's to do with the packaging of it into something which is uh, which is more exciting but the good news is that innovation is and will always remain a fundamental engineering role because you're always going to be challenged to use the capabilities in a different way so this is not a bolted together tool flow with all of the pieces linked irrevocably one to another it's about being ingenious about how these things fit together and about ingenious because once you once you do that thing you create something which has got a product differentiation and that differentiation sorry that ingenuity is of course what makes a, an innovative product so I'm being timed out fortunately we get to the conclusion slide conclusions then this is only repeating what I've just said but capabilities are the link between research outcomes and products we should both bear that in mind because you should be aiming to get things to capability or at least so close to capability that you can do that handshake with industry industry has got to realize that it needs its capabilities because otherwise it hasn't got a future it's only got what it can do now <coughs> um, capabilities limit a company's product possibilities so the capabilities that we've got essentially steer limit what we can do now it, it could be fine you could introduce a, a brand new capability which would enable us to do things in optoelectronics that you know we're quite 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 exciting things in optoelectronics but it's not where our business is our business is also defining us is also part of that capability so we can't change too much and capabilities make the product development process more predictable this is fundamental I mean business it actually does take effort to design a product even when you know what to do it takes a lot of time beforehand to work out what you need to do and that's the research part of it what we're talking about is going through the process of development it has to be as predictable as possible <coughs> and the point there that um, uh, is worth particularly bringing out is that not all technologies offer benefits in all products or in all companies and then the final point uh, we really have to have exploitation before we've got success 
because it's only when end customers buy products incorporating or using the technology that there's money that starts to flow back down the chain. We want to thank you for your contribution. We could do that by helping to support you in your new research programs, either support you with cash or support you in support letters or whatever. But when something is successful, then there is a flow down because that successful thing wants to go forward. And we have to remember all the time that the people who are ultimately buying these products don't care about the technology which is in them. And so we've got, to, that's a separate issue and is another, another talk in its own right, but we have to do something ourselves to make sure that people value what we do. And actually, if you can describe what you do in that terms of the capability model, then actually I've, I've used this on my wife and she understands what I do in a way which I've never been able to explain before. That's a good start. There's 60 million people in the UK and 7 billion in the world. Then obviously we have to propagate this message. Thank you very much for listening.